problem. We'll I'll make sure to leave some time for her. <laughs> Very good. Recording. Thank you. Perfect. So, so I'm good to go from yeah. here, Ja. No, I just um, was waiting for the the recording to kick in. Sometimes okay. there's a bit of lag there. Uh, okay, so I just want to introduce to you uh, our, our uh, one of our sessions today from the Digital Transformation in Government 2023, uh, Jacques Trottier, uh, who works at Transport Canada, and he'll be speaking today on a process mining case study in Canadian government. Over to you. Perfect. Thanks very much. Uh, hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, so today I'm going to talk about process mining uh, and the work that I did during my master's research project in collaboration with my employer, Transport Canada. Um, so we'll start off with an introduction on what process mining is. Uh, we'll go on, to, uh, for those of you who are new to it, we'll explain what it is, you know, why it's exciting. Uh, and then from there, I'll get in, in the second half of the presentation, I'll get into uh, the case study and the work that we did at Transport Canada and uh, and share some, some of the amazing findings that uh, we came up with during my uh, research project. Um, so as I said, my name is Jacques Trete. I'm actually the manager of the Automation Center of Expertise at Transport Canada. So we do things like robotic process automation, uh, workflow automation, uh, also process mining, amongst other things. And uh, for the last few years, I've had the pleasure of completing a master's degree in digital transformation and innovation at the University of Ottawa, uh, where my research focus was on applied process mining. And during that time, I had the pleasure of uh, being supervised by Daniel Mio, who's a PhD in computer science at the University of Ottawa. And I also got to work alongside Naja al Garib, who's actually presenting after me. Uh, and she's going to share some exciting research that she's doing on process mining and RPA. So I'd like to start off the introduction of process mining with a familiar story for anyone who's worked with or dealt with large organizations. So in this scenario, let's say you have a problem with your pay and in government, we know that's a pretty hot topic these days. So let's pretend you're a government employee. You send off and you write an email to your, your pay team because you're not getting paid and you pray and you hope that you're gonna get a response. And then comes the dreaded autoresponder from the group mailbox saying, at some point between now and never, you're, you, you're gonna get a response and things will work out. So you wait and you hope that your email doesn't go into a black hole. And because you're not getting paid, you decide to buy yourself some craft dinner because you don't know how long it's gonna be between now and the next paycheck. So you pray, and fortunately, at least at Transport Canada, because we have an awesome pay team, we find out that everything's gonna be okay and your, pays, your pay issue has been rectified and life can go on. So once again, you feel like you've won against the, the the group autoresponder mailboxes that can tend to be you know a little ominous in terms of service levels and delivery so you decide to don donate your kd to the local food shelter and you go for a steak dinner but it's important to talk about what's happened here because the lack of process visibility creates anxiety for a lot of people requesting these services and experiences such as these don't inspire trust or confidence both clients and managers expect ongoing communication and they wanna know how these processes are performing. And everyone at the end of the day simply just wants a window into what's happening. So let's talk about process mining. So process mining is a family of techniques related to the fields of data science and process management. It provides a window into your processes and it's almost like an X-ray. And the way we go about process mining is we generate process maps which are derived from event logs. Now, before we get too technical, don't worry, I'll explain what event logs are so that we can make sense of how this all works. So what's an event log? You may know this as an audit log or a history, and it's nothing more than a trace of events that happen to deliver a service or, or complete a case. So I've got a screenshot uh, in the above uh, right here from our Oracle ERP that shows the steps that it took to get from uh, submitting a timesheet to the time that it's approved. And similarly under here, I've got another example from our pilot medical system at Transport Canada that shows some of the steps that were taken to complete a case, basically to certify a, a pilot to be able to fly. And using this kind of data, we can take the timestamps and generate these lovely process maps like I have on the right here. And it allows us to extract insights like how long does it take to get from step A to step B and where might the bottlenecks be and how might we address them? And often what we find is that what we think is happening and what's happening in reality are two different things. And we know that sometimes even similar divisions in different regions or even in the same team might be executing the steps and achieving the same outcome, but they're executing them in slightly different ways. 
And so what we're trying to do is discover what the happy path is that leads to the most effective service outcomes. Because in the ugliest of scenarios, you end up with what we call spaghetti diagrams like this that really don't paint a good picture as to how we're delivering our services. And so in a nutshell, process mining allows us to take data from different systems such as your CRM, ERP, and so on, generate these event logs like we've been discussing and turn them into process maps like we have on the right here. And the opportunity here is that process mining provides a new way to rediscover existing processes, analyze them for deficiencies, and identify opportunities of, for enhancement, all of which is essential to modernizing service delivery. Now, who could benefit from this? Well, the government's been in the press a lot lately, sometimes for better or worse. Perhaps the passport issues that we had recently could be one area. Or what about the COVID relief during the pandemic? Or if I pick on my own employer, some of the delays that we had with recertifying pilots after the pandemic uh, based on the, their medical records. And so why would we do process mining? Surely you could just go about and interview people and stitch together a process and, and figure out what it looks like using more manual techniques. But what we often find is that most people often only have a, or know a small piece of the overall process, a very subjective experience. And so if you start to interview many of these stakeholders, it's a very time consuming and expensive process. Uh, and you might even look at things like standard operating procedures, but we often, what we often find there too, is that these are undocumented or very outdated and the process is often drifted. And so the wonderful thing about process mining is that we're able to use data that lives in our existing systems and be able to extract or discover process maps uh, in a more objective fashion uh, with a lot more insight. And so there's three types of process mining. So far I've talked about uh, discovery and process conformance, but there's also enhancement. In discovery, what we're trying to do, like I said, is take a look at the event logs and generate the existing process map or the as-is process map. And we're typically asking questions like, what tasks are performed in what order? Which activities have the longest processing time? Should some of them be el eliminated? And then we move on to conformance, which is comparing the as-is versus the ideal process, a little bit like what I talked about. And we're trying to see you know, what's causing delays in the process, or, and are we achieving our service level agreements? Because oftentimes in government, we have services that we charge a fee for, but we can only charge that fee if we deliver the service within the stated service level agreement. Because when we don't, we end up running into what's called remittances where basically we have to refund uh, the customer the fee that they would have paid for the service. And finally, when we get into enhancement, we take the results from both conformance and discovery and continuously improve the process until a point that we reach diminishing returns. And we might also look at opportunities like which areas might be good for automation, such as robotic pro process automation or other activities. And so now I'll jump into my research topic, which consisted of looking at proce the process mining of security clearances in the Canadian government. And so just to provide a little bit of context here for any of those um, here who haven't you know, applied or worked in government before, anytime you wanna work with government, whether you're an employer or a consultant, you typically have to go uh, undergo a security review process. And for those of you who have been through it, you know that it can be a long and cumbersome process depending on the clearance level that you're seeking. And the level of clearance ultimately depends on the sensitivity of the information that you're handling in your day-to-day -day job. And in our project, what we decided to do was uh, look at clearance levels or the process mining of clearances for reliability status. And for obvious reasons, we excluded security and top secret clearances to uh, protect, protect the, you know, the confidentiality around some of the things that go on there. And so if we scroll back to the pandemic uh, and, and go back a couple of years now to when it first started, we found ourselves in a pretty interesting scenario where uh, if we were gonna be able to continue hiring, we wanted to make the experience as touchless and seamless as possible. And back then what we were often doing is people were filling out this PDF form for a clearance. Um, and it was a very long form, very cumbersome as, as I've mentioned. And there would be this dance that would go back and forth from the time you would submit the PDF form, it would go back and forth between the security screening team and the applicant until such time that they were happy that the form you know, had no errors and everything was correct. But that ultimately de delays the hiring uh, of new employees in government and can be you know, very time consuming. So what we decided to do at the start of the pandemic was actually build a new security screening platform. And we were able to digitize the form 
and be able to make it online and add a lot more validation and, and you know, rules around what we would accept for data to try and make it so that there wouldn't be this ongoing dance uh, between security screening and a new employee, um, you know, to make sure that we would increase the acceptance rates of, of applications on the first time. And so having launched that system, we ultimately wanted to look at, you know, process mining it and seeing, you know, what is the performance of this? Now that we've gone from a very paper-based process to uh, something that is, you know, a little bit more modern, um, we wanted to see exactly what were the results we were getting and where were the other opportunities for, for improvement. And, and the system was ultimately divided into two sort of components, one being the applicant portal where people filled out the form, and then there was a back office component where our security screening team worked to, uh, to handle the processing of the applications and ultimately grant a security clearance. So the methodology for this process mining uh, project consisted of using Python and uh, a log filtering API, which I'll explain shortly, um, to do much of the, the data filtering and cleanup. Uh, we then used a tool called Disco for the process discovery. And, and finally, we did some social mining using Prom. And uh, one of the benefits about using Python with this log filtering API, which by the way, was actually developed by uh, Najal Ghari, who will be presenting next, um, was that you know this this tool allows us to do a lot of the cleanup before and um, allows us for anyone who's ever worked with things like Python notebooks, we're able to sort of journal the steps that we took along the way, so that we have good replicability. We can add a lot of comments and notes for explainability to explain why we transformed our data a certain way, uh, and it also allows for portability. So now that we've you know created this notebook where we've extracted the raw data from our system and run it through this notebook for cleaning. If any time we want to rerun the process mining in the future, well, we've got essentially a script now with all the steps that we've taken to clear, clean the data so that we can run at any time. There are other ways you could do this. Of course, you could bring the data into Excel and clean it up. But one of the things we find is that, um, you know, you often forget the steps that you took along the way to clean the data. So if you wanted to rerun the same analysis later on in the future, um, you know, you might forget some of those steps. And so ultimately, Whenever we extracted the data from our database, we had 353 cases. And after filtering and cleanup, we ended up with 273. There's a couple of different reasons for this. Um, some of them being that um, the system was fairly new and had just launched. And so there was a bit of drift in the process and you know things were stabilizing on the system. So even though the system launched around April of 2021, um, we ultimately chose to look at a data set or and a sample uh, starting in January up until October of uh, 2022. And the findings were quite remarkable in a lot of different ways. I'll provide a short uh, walkthrough of the process just so you get a, a high level sense of uh, what it, what's required from start to finish. But basically the way it starts is a manager uh, requests a, a screening for a new hire or someone that they would like to, um, to bring on board. And then from there, the applicant or new hire gets an email invitation to complete um, the security screening uh, process. From there, um, it goes through typical background checks. The manager will have a session to verify ID with the application to make sure that they are who they say they are. Uh, it goes through some record checks and background checks. And then we end up at what's called a briefing where uh, if everything goes well and that person is cleared, then they go through a briefing so that uh, where they're explained essentially, here are your responsibilities as a clearance holder. And uh, here's what to do, what not to do with government information. And after all that's completed, their clearance is granted and they can move forward with hiring that person. Uh, overall, initially this was taking on average about 30 days to complete. And uh, you know, I mentioned that there's a lot of back and forth back with the PDF and paper-based process. Um, in this new digitized version, we noticed that only about 58% of applications were accepted on the first try. So there was still some more work to do there to look at what was going on. We also noticed these loops that you'll see along the process uh, map, which indicate rework or having to do the activities more than twice, which I'll get into a little bit later. And then finally, at the end, the security briefing that I was talking about, that, that could actually take up to seven days sometimes. So let's unpack all of this and go into greater detail. Um, so what we found is, again, 42% of cases underwent amendment, meaning that, um, you know, they had to go through multiple corrections. And we found in th through this that on average, it was adding about two days in delay to the hiring process. Uh, of course, I mentioned it's a long application form, so there's a lot of potential for errors to be made. But of course, with a, you know, a digitized application form, we should be able to uh, 
and the increased validation, we should be able to minimize those errors. So we wanted to dig deeper into this and figure out what was going on. And one of the most common issues that kept reoccurring was around this field called given names. And we found that there was actually a lot of confusion from people around what this field meant. In many cases, a lot of people were including their family names or excluding their middle names from that field, um, both of which were incorrect, of course, and, uh, and would lead to you know, a rejection on the first shot. Um, we also noticed uh, overlaps in residences. So when you complete your, your security screening application, um, you do have to sometimes provide a residence history stating where you live for the past five or 10 years and so on. Uh, and so you'll run into cases, for example, where you have a student who might be you know, studying on campus somewhere, but they also mark themselves as living at their permanent address back home with their family. So there's cases like that that would come up. And another one that came up was expired ID documents. Um, this portal actually allows us to, uh, or allows the applicants to be able to upload scans of their driver's license and passport. Um, but presently it was accepting, uh, you know, it wouldn't really check to see were those uh, ID documents valid or not. And so as we started brainstorming around this, we were trying to figure out what could we do sort of in the short term, medium term and long term uh, in order to, you know, fix some of these challenges and increase the acceptance rate overall for applications. And the obvious, you know, first move was around the given names field and adding a lot more, you know, UX or UI enhancements, adding things like tooltips so that we can indicate clearly, for example, like here's what to include and here's what to exclude. You know, don't put your family name there because that goes under the surname field. Um, and so we've since done that on the application form and uh, we're awaiting data to see what the results are. Um, longer term ideas that we also had were things like, uh, you know, we, we could use OCR technology to uh, look at the scanned uploads of the uh, of the ID documents and and see are they expired or active or or valid, and uh, and then we could even extract the the proper name you know with middle names for someone so that both the given names and surname field and all that could be uh, populated automatically and then again minimize the error uh, or the the potential for errors here and ultimately increase the acceptance rate. Um, so lots of ideas there. I mean, there's other ones like uh, tying into APIs with you know the provincial uh, governments for for driver's license and health cards. But uh, but uh, yeah, no, some really interesting findings on this one. And uh, next, I'll get more into the uh, reworks and loops. So I've got here a sort of a simulation playing of the process map, and these are actually uh, real life transactions that went through during the time period uh, in 2022 that I mentioned. And so what you're seeing here are these around these loops are these sort of slow moving tokens here that represent almost bottlenecks or activities that are having to happen more than once. And uh, what we found, for example, with the applicant email invitation when they were invited to uh, fill out an application on the portal is that in 16% of cases, applicants needed to be reminded to fill out their application uh, and go on the portal. And that could be for a number of different reasons. Um, for example, it could be that, um, you know, maybe the email went to their spam box or um, or perhaps they had trouble getting set up on the portal. Um, we do ask and, and ask them to set up two-factor authentication. And so maybe they got, you know, confused or, or uh, ran into issues there. Um, again, there's a step here where the manager has to have a session with the applicant to verify their IDs. Uh, and in 27% of cases, uh, managers had to be reminded to do the activity. And, and that's not that surprising. I mean, managers, if you're anything like myself, managers are fairly busy. You get a lot of emails in a day and it's easy for a task like that to get lost in the shuffle. Um, and finally, going at the security briefing, we noticed that again, in about 6% of cases, managers had to be reminded to complete the security briefing. But I think what was really a lot more interesting in the security briefing was the time that it took for us to, um, to, to be able to complete the briefing. The briefing itself is not actually a very long activity, but we we're noticing that on average, it would take about seven days from the time that the briefing was requested by the, for the manager to complete to the time that it was actually done. And again, this is a case of managers being busy. And when we start to think about, you know, what, what could we do here to remove the manager from the equation or make things a little bit more seamless and, and, and remove that bottleneck. The, the security screening department first came up with the idea of why don't we switch to just holding a team session uh, four times a week. So two in, two in English, two in French, they're pre-scheduled, the applicants join this session and they undergo their briefing. And then after that, the clearance is granted and everything is done. And that was, that was, that was a great first step. Um, 
why not take it a step further and embed a video on the security screening portal that someone could watch and digitally sign and basically acknowledge that they accept their responsibilities as a, as a security clearance holder and take it from there. And in doing something like that, not only does that eliminate a seven day bottleneck, but when we consider the fact that managers were completing this task before, and if we, just some high level math here, let's say managers spend on average 10 minutes to do this, this activity with the applicant and you know, transport processes about 3000 of these in a year. We're saving managers about 500 hours a year by now having removed them from this part of the process and switching to an online video. So for me, that was one of the really huge insights around why and how process finding can be so powerful. The, la the last thing we looked at was um, a different type of process mining called social mining. And this is where you can take the event log data that we looked at and figure out you know, what's the size and influence of the different stakeholders involved in the process. So, you know, we talk about a lot about the applicant and the hiring manager. You know, we do deal with the credit bureau. People do undergo credit checks uh, whenever they're going through a security clearance. Uh, there's obviously the security department. And while the sort of handover of work model here that I generated um, visually wasn't the most useful, it, it does sort of depict like the size of the circles here show the relative level of influence that each stakeholder has. But I, I think what was more telling is when we looked at the table here and saw just exactly how much uh, each stakeholder was involved in the overall process, it led us to realize that even though security, uh, the security department owns the process, they're really at the mercy of a lot of other stakeholders or relying on a lot of, a lot of other stakeholders to complete the process. And so when we go back to the to something like the security briefing that I just talked about, where we were able to remove the hiring manager from the equation, that was a, a huge win in terms of being able to, um, you know, add some influence to the process and remove a bottleneck in a way that not only helps the manager, but also helps the security team be able to accomplish their goal of processing clearances uh, much, much faster. And so what are the limitations of this work? Well, for now, it's reliability status only. Um, we're still looking at, uh, you know, doing this for secret and other levels, probably not publishing that work. Um, we're going to be rerunning, as I said, the analysis to see what the effects are before and after all of these changes that we've done. Um, we're just waiting to gather a bit more data to be able to do that. Uh, of course, these findings can't necessarily be generalized to all the government of Canada because um, not everyone's running the same system that we're using, um, but it does provide opportunities for other departments to understand where potential bottlenecks might lie in the process and how they might go about addressing them. Uh, and of course, this methodology and process mining as a whole is quite new and uh, is going to be subject to a lot of refinement and, and enhancements in the future, which you know I'm certainly very excited to be a part of. So what are the next steps for all of this? Um, well, we're going to be publishing this work uh, in a case study soon enough. We'll also be, um, you know, the, the API that Naja developed and that was also uh, turned into Python will be open sourced. And we would invite anyone who's interested to be to, that might want to work on it to join us and uh, and be a part of this. Uh, I'm fortunate enough in my work at Transport Canada that uh, the results, the early results that we got from this, um, really uh, got some some great buy-in and attention around it uh, to the point where I applied for and received innovation funding. And now I have the pleasure of building a COE around this, uh, where we'll be sort of building a roadmap of processes. Uh, uh, that we prioritize to mine and uh, and work on really getting more enhanced visibility on uh, you know our different various levels of processes and how, how they're operating. Uh, we're also going to be working with our enterprise architecture teams to update our develop application development standards to make sure that we're building what's called process aware information systems that we can you know actively process mine. And uh, my long my long term vision is even though we're sort of running process mining right now as a sort of on a you know, ad hoc basis, you know, we have a vision that with this technology, we're going to be able to mine it on a continuous basis ongoing. Um, there's no reason why one day soon enough, you shouldn't be able to log into, uh, you know, your BI dashboard and, and have a section that shows your, you know, your process maps and how they're operating, you know, week over week, month over month, quarter over quarter, and so on. And, uh, and I'm also very interested in potentially starting a, uh, a Government of Canada process mining community of practice. So, um, for anyone that might be interested in that, I would love to hear more from you. And with that, I would just like to say thanks for joining my presentation. And uh, I would love to answer any questions if anyone has any.
Hey, everybody, just a reminder that there's a Q&A button at the bottom there that you can just press on and uh, click on and you can uh, ask questions. Uh, until uh, we get some, uh, we can always talk a little bit about, um, I don't know if you want to talk about um, any any of your lessons learned in terms of things that you, you spoke about, um, <laughs> you did to, to sort of uh, um, correct, I guess, some of the things that were that you felt like might have been uh, uh, not perfect with the form, uh, the online form. Is there, yeah. are there are there other things like that you found that were problematic that you thought, okay, well, this this is not um, any cons to what you're doing, um, any issues with data? Um, yeah, and, yeah. So I think the biggest challenge uh, that we ran into, um, or initially when I was looking for a project, um, is data is the hardest thing to get your hands on. Um, it's uh, getting people, especially um, in, in process mining, getting getting people to be willing to give you the permissions to to, uh, to get access to this data, to be able to mine it, um, takes, takes some selling, if you will, um, because there's a risk that business or process owners often see in that, you know, well, this, this, this might, you know, expose some dirty laundry, if you will, or areas that are not running. And so you want to, you want to be sure, I guess, not to, um, you know, to reassure them that you're going in into this as a, a partner and that you're not here to sort of process shame them and that really you want to work with them to identify the bottlenecks or the issues and, um, you know, and work together on finding solutions. Like for me, running an automation COE, like what we oftentimes, like, you know, we get excited when we find these these issues because it's like, okay, is there a technology we can apply? Is there, you know, things like robotic process automation and all that, but of course, you know, some of these process owners are like, well, you know, how does this make me look, right? So um, I think that was one of the biggest challenges initially was just like, who could we get uh, buy-in from and who would be, you know, willing to sort of embark on this with us uh, to make it happen? Uh, and I do see some questions in the uh, in the chat here. So yeah, I don't know. Yeah, they're really starting to pop up. <laughs> So from Jennifer, we have, do you have other use cases? Uh, ATIP processes in government are criticized often. Is that too big of a project Project and are there projects that are too big? Yeah, um, great question. So we have other use cases we're working on right now. So um, with this, with our client and security screening, um, they actually do what, what's called transportation security clearances, which is, so anyone who works in a controlled uh, airport or marine port, you know, whether you're a pilot, um, uh, a captain or, um, you know, even if you work at like a Tim Hortons in the controlled airspace, you have to undergo what's called a, tra uh, a TSC or transportation security clearance. And that's a much higher volume uh, process than security than uh, clearances we looked at initially. So that one has about 80,000 transactions a year. And that's one we're working on right now. Um, and that, you know, it interfaces a lot with private industry. You know, when we have delays on that, it delays them being able to hire people to work in those areas. So that's um, that's one that we're actively working on. We've got a couple of other internal processes, like the most famous process mining case that, uh, especially if you read the academic literature that's studied is, uh, you know, procure to pay from the time you, you know, you, you procure a solution till it, the, the last invoice is paid. Uh, there's lots of literature on that and we are looking at that internally as well to see, uh, you know, what, what kind of opportunities exist there. ATIP's an interesting one because my team actually, I, I've got a portfolio of internal um, uh, of internal service applications on my team and we actually manage the ATIP system. And that's something we haven't looked at yet, mainly because uh, we're in the middle of switching and, and actually the majority of the government uh, is in the middle of migrating to one of two solutions being ATIP Express or Amanda. Um, I, I, I do think it's a great idea. Like once, once we've moved to those newer solutions to mine that because I know there's been a lot of press, mostly not great press around how long it's taken, uh, taking to answer requests like that. So that's definitely on our radar. It's not something we're doing right now, um, but definitely, uh, you know, once our new system's in place and we've got some data there, I think that would be a, a great opportunity. As for whether there's projects that are too big, I mean, you know, some processes will span multiple systems, multiple divisions, you know, especially if they're enterprise wide processes like that, like that can be, um, you know, there's a lot of different data sources to get data from, and then you have to sort of cross reference 
the, the you know the life cycle of of data or of a case from one system to another and trace it from the time it starts and finishes. Like um, one we'd love to do is HR onboarding. Um, so from the time you consider hiring someone to the time they're actually starting on day one, but there's so many systems involved, like from HR systems to finance, you know, Phoenix for pay, IT for getting their equipment that like, that's a really, you know, trying to get the data from all those different sources and, you know, compile it into a single event log is a, pretty daunting task so not to say you can't do it um but maybe you want to start on more on sub processes like we we focus just on clearances for now maybe next we would look at the help desk for when someone gets their it their it equipment um and then you know over time we could stitch together all of those into the enterprise process but i'm i'm a big proponent of trying to show value early so rather than try and do something big and end-to-end -end, like pick areas where you suspect there might be challenges uh, and typically you will know where they are uh, and then, you know, do the mining and, and see what that brings you. And then it's a lot easier to get buy-in and, and more interest from there. Um, right. We've got another question. Oh, yeah. yeah another go ahead. Question. Do you have any advice or thoughts on measuring, measuring tasks that are done manually outside of the system? Would you consider asking users to manually track their time for a period? Good question. I typically don't recommend, I mean, you could ask people to do that and I guess you could mine it. That's one way of doing it. Um, I'm typically, I, I, what I've told or you know, said internally is like, I don't go after, or we don't entertain processes where, especially like, you know, I was making fun of group mailboxes, like email is a very hard thing to mine, like, and, and getting the timestamps around all those activities. Typically, what I recommend is if you've got a case or something that's in, you know, like a lot of a lot of government departments use Microsoft Dynamics. So if you've got, uh, you know, that, or we use we also use Appian uh, or your ERP system. Ideally, start with systems that have data already uh, and that are relatively clean. Um, not nothing's a hundred percent, but at least if you've got the base data and and some of these, you know, case management ERP systems that. That, especially if you're looking for a quick win, that's where I would start. You could, of course, record things manually, but um, it's, it's, it's not the first opportunity I would look for personally. Um, okay. Yeah. All right, there's another question here. Excellent presentation. You made the use case very seamless. What were the areas of, of surprise that consumed more time and resources than expected? It actually took a lot of time to find like a sort of a sponsor or um, someone willing to share their data that once I got my hands on the data, I, I was lucky that this data set was relatively clean. Um, so the data cleanup could have been much worse. And we're seeing that actually with another uh, use case right now that it, um, you know, there are varying degrees of, you know, data cleanliness. But um, so I would say like for this particular project, Data cleaning wasn't too bad. It is a lot of work. I don't want to underestimate it. Most of the time probably will be spent cleaning your data. Loading the, the clean data set into a process mining tool uh, isn't the hard part. Then you get to do the fun part, which is analysis after. Um, but uh, yeah, I think surprise is you know, just making sure that you've got players willing to um, you know, to jump in on this and, and, and lend you their data. Because a lot of people, you know, they're quick to say, especially with security clearances. Like I was really surprised that was the case that we got to work on because most people would say like that, that's no, that's, you know, that's the national security of our country and stuff. But, you know, and I wasn't even sure, honestly, if I was going to be able to share this case study in detail, but the more we looked at it, the more you realize that a lot of what we've shared today, it's already spelled out in policy that's public on the, the treasury board website. Like the whole standard on security screening um, shows, that tells you the high level steps that it takes uh, to complete cl a clearance. So um, like, again, if you were to go back to the process ma uh, maps that we generated, they're not, uh, there's really nothing confidential in there. We're showing you a little bit around our performance metrics, but um, from what I've heard across government transport is doing quite well relative to other departments. So I, I don't, you know, I don't think we're embarrassing the department in any way by sharing this. And if, if anything, it, it makes us look like leaders. So um yeah, I, I'd say be prepared with data. Data comes in, you know, varying degrees of cleanliness. And I was lucky with this one, but 
um, you will spend a lot of time on, on cleanup. Okay, yeah, recently we've had some uh, presentations at the Government of Canada Enterprise Architecture Review Board for uh, uh, RPA as well. Um, are, are your, is your team part of like a, that, that sort of GC-wide um, group? And uh, what is it that you, you basically have been able to uh, leverage or, or benefit from that? In terms of like our RPA automations or? In terms of like a, 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 a GC-wide uh, community of RPA uh, developers and, uh, and designers. Yeah, I mean, we do. We've occasionally presented at the the Government of Canada Enterprise Architecture uh, COP. Um, so we do, and then I know SSC has an interdepartmental um, group as well, um, where they get you know all the uh, departments together every now and then to engage on different topics. Uh, we are part of that. Uh, we do try to um, to sort of spread the expertise that we have uh, amongst departments. For example, like these. Uh, the security screening platform that we're using has been picked up by ESDC. Uh, they are using it. Um, and there are other departments that have been knocking on our door, curious to, to adopt it. So uh, that is something that we offer in various shapes. Um, not to say like, you know, there's different arrangements. Like in the case of ESDC, we actually help the host host it for them, but uh, it's not typically what we do. But uh, yeah, we do try to spread our expertise uh, you know, not only within our department, but uh, um, uh, you know, across the GOC whenever possible. I don't know if that helps answer your question or. Oh yes, absolutely. Um, okay, uh, so I guess uh, do you have any uh, closing thoughts? I guess there's. Well, I see a few other oh, questions. Sorry. I didn't realize there are other questions. Okay. The next uh, one is business process and data are closely held by all institutions, institutions and departments. What role did the tools and simulation play in obtaining executive support? Um, I will say that when we showed them the the, the findings and like it, it was kind of funny, especially with security screening, when we showed them the findings uh, the first time around and um, you know what they were able to uncover, like the first thing that our DG in, in that group said was she's like, I don't think you realize the the feeling of relief that I had when I was able to see that and visualize it and understand where the issues were. Um, so it is very powerful. I think, you know, if you're able, again, once you get your hands on data, um, if you're able to show that value and, and show the power of it, like for us, the buy-in was gained instantly. Like we, since then that, that whole business line has said, anything else you want to mine, like you tell us and, and go ahead with it. So, um, but it does take convincing and that's the hardest part of as I've been saying. And, and I think part of the way you can convince it is that you need to explain um, to these, you know, these data holders, especially like, you know, they're, they're just looking out for themselves. Right. And you can't, you can't fault them for, you know, not wanting data to get in the wrong hands. Nobody wants to end up in the press for, you know, accidentally leaking data. Right. And, and, and it's happened. Um, but if you explain to them, especially in the case of process mining, like you don't always, most of the time you don't need, the entire data set like for security clearances you know we're not asking for all the private information about people like you know there's a ton of sensitive information in that data but we're asking for essentially three columns like we're asking for a timestamp what activity happened and what was the like the transaction id and we can actually even further anonymize those case ids or transaction ids so that we can't even tie it back to the original person so there there, there are ways to you know, mask this data and protect it in a way where, um, you know, you can reassure the, you know, the data holders that, you know, we will safeguard that information. And, um, and again, because you're only asking for a small snapshot of data, you're not asking for all the tables and columns, like that's another way to, uh, to reassure, you know, the partners that you're working with that you, you're not asking something, you know, unrealistic. Very good. Uh, last question. Oh, no, there's more questions coming. Uh, what role and or integration did enterprise architecture play in getting to the process mining? None. <laughs> Not to say that they shouldn't. Uh, I see a lot of ties between what we're doing and enterprise architecture. Like every time we're discovering a process that should be going into the repository or the inventory of processes that, you know, the EA team would hold. Hold. And, and, you know, in a super, you know, in my utopic vision of what process mining could do, um, 
you know, in an ideal world, I, I, EA, sh you know, if, if every process were continuously mined in an organization and you had almost like a digital twin of what was happening in your organization, it would make life a lot easier to prioritize digital investments. Like if you could, year over year, if you could look at how processes were performing and say, okay, these are the most problematic areas and this is what's impacting Canadian citizens the most, like let's invest here. It would make, would probably make EA's life a lot easier. Um, so there, there's a lot of tie-ins between EA and what process mining offers. Um, specifically within our, our department, like we haven't collaborated with EA as much, but I do see the role that they play. Thank you for that. Uh, time permitting, can you comment on the plans uh, around the social process mining that you've been doing? Yeah, it, it's an interesting uh, other like, you know, side area of process mining. It, it's not the main one that main area that people look at, but you know, there is power in, in seeing obviously, you know, the, the levels of influence from different stakeholders, especially if you, you know, you have a lot of them, like the case study that I showed, or like, like in, in, in this, you know, presentation, it wasn't the most useful, but I remember reading a case study in the literature where um, they were looking at cancer patients and the journey that they take, um, because especially in health, like no, a lot of times the journeys are very unique, like not everyone follows necessarily a happy path. And so in that case study, they looked at social mining because they wanted to see like, okay, if you're a cancer patient, like what are the different groups that you deal with during your treatment? Um, and you know, in that case study, one of the things that they were surprised was is that um, these patients would uh, consult a lot more with the dietics department than they realize. And 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 when you think about it, it's not that surprising. Like if you're undergoing chemo, your your whole diet's probably messed up, and and you know, so you probably have to go see a dietitian and and figure out like you know what what's going to work for me while I'm in treatment. So, um, so th there are you know areas where it, it's definitely useful. Uh, just maybe not as much in, in this particular use case, but yeah, if you've got a lot of players in a process, um, I, I do see the power in it. I, I don't have any plans per se around it. It's something that, you know, as we're analyzing a process, if we think it's worth looking at uh, sort of in addition to the main process discovery, then we'll do it. Um, usually the data that we've extracted already can easily, you know, be socially mined and, and that's what we would, you know, that's where we go with it. Okay, thank you. Okay, now we've run out of questions. Uh, do you have any any uh, uh, final thoughts? Um, well, no, it's it's an extreme pleasure of mine to be able to share this with anyone. And you know, whether you're in the government of Canada or not, I invite anyone. Certainly, uh, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn or or whatnot. I'm happy to uh, you know to to talk more about it. I think this is a really fascinating type of technology, especially with you know some of the headlines we've seen in the press. Uh, you know, related to government services. I think process mining is is coming in at a very interesting time and can help us in a lot of ways. And so if if anyone, you know, wants to bounce off ideas or talk some more about it, I'm, I'm extremely passionate about this. I would love to speak with you and uh, you can find me on LinkedIn. So thanks very much again, everyone for joining and uh, have a great rest of the uh, conference. And thanks very much, Jacques, for your presentation. All Thank right. you. It's much appreciated, great presentation. Thanks again. Okay. All right, for everybody, you'll have to uh, you'll have to uh, disconnect to this one to connect to the next one. Um, and so uh, basically, uh, we'll just be uh, closing off now.